So there's been a lot of talk about Strawberry 01. It is out and it's amazing. But Sasha, is this the game changer you're hoping for? Yes, but there's some pretty important things that I think we should talk about that no one else is talking about. All right, the big headline, 01 Strawberry, it's out and it's all about reasoning. So Sasha, just unpack for us what's so special about its reasoning capabilities. Yeah. Chain of thought is a reasoning process where a model breaks down a problem into step-by-step you know, stages in order to arrive at a solution and try to be a little bit more transparent and, and to make it a little bit more accurate. It's an approach commonly used in AI to improve the decision-making and, and problem-solving process. And what's so special about it's like I went on to OpenAI's website, I clicked on and go, oh, it's using Chain of Thought. It was kind of a letdown because it's a prompt engineering technique. You kind of can manually walk your own AI models today to do the same thing. And when I saw them doing that, like, oh, that's that's it. I thought there was something more special. Well, that's the thing. They call it chain of thought, but I actually think there's a lot more happening under the hood. Um, and it's there's a couple of so- signs that this may be the case, because if you actually try and ask it to explain its reasoning, it won't. And then if you ask enough times, you'll get an email saying, hey, <laughs> stop asking these questions or we'll cancel your subscription. So that that at least in part tells me that there is something under the hood that they don't want everyone else to know. Um, and there is something that, you know, and even on their website, they actually do cite that, look, due to competitive, um, you know, advantage as one of the, the reasons, we don't necessarily want to show everything that's that's happening here. But if you do look, I've got a post here, um, Ted, he summarizes a lot of the research papers here. And I have to agree that like, there is a lot of really fantastic research that's come out in the last 12 months, which I think is actually driving a lot of the the capability here. So as amazing as the reasoning is, there's a part that was kind of a, no one's talking about, which is on their website, they show you all of the like exams, standardized exams it's been taking, like AP physics, AP chemistry, AP bio, college chemistry and all this stuff. But it's a uh, AP lit, English lit and AP uh, English language. It got basically a three on its AP exam, I calculated, which is basically my level, which is sad. I mean, come on, all of these advances, except you don't see it on like, I guess where it counts, like English language. So were you surprised? Yes, initially, but then no, when I thought about it, because when you look at chain of thought and these Monte Carlo simulation trees and, and all of the test time compute, what it's doing is breaking down these complex problems of reasoning and logic. And if you look at it, like AP Lit doesn't have as much of those sorts of um, problems. So where it's made those mistakes in the past in those um, fields, it's fixing it. And so it's getting a moderate boost. But you know, it is primarily in the physics, chemistry, law, where it, which have very reasoning um, heavy fields. So I'm not surprised actually when I, when I think about it. I guess, you know, I, I get it. Like on a practical side, like, look, it can do math, they can do physics. With this new tech, your Uber will come faster. Like it's, it will impact life. Yeah. But when it comes to like the letters, journalism, writing, I kind of want to take open AI and go, man, listen to me, because you're not really listening to me. It, it, it kind of just glosses over what I'm saying and maybe just looks at a bunch of tokens, but it's not looking at the semantics and the meaning behind it. So I don't know how I feel about it, but yeah, I'm torn. I think there is a slightly different data set that's, that's missing for some of those sorts of things, which is very intention heavy and also almost simulating human emotions, which a lot of these models haven't done and and i don't think ha- actually have a huge amount of um priority uh, we're doing i think a lot of that is being inferred indirectly through reinforcement learning through human feedback currently but that's not the best way to, to do it they're not truly learning um through that method you're right they've been collecting data basically probably showing how you break down problems they have a lot of data sets like on math problems look at exams how people break down problems but when you look at the english language and a and a, and a set of writing it's kind of hard to kind of break it down. Either you get it or you don't, right? And I guess they just don't have the data to teach it how to uh, kind of up break out a piece of writing, I guess. And there is a there is also an interesting thing here. They started, uh, they posted in November of last year that they were looking for data sets with intention. And it's a very unique data set that they're looking for. And I think that will actually help with some of this stuff as well. That is pretty cool, Sasha. Yeah, and another thing, the way that these models are working is it's using something called test time compute. And all that is, is just a fancy way of saying, as opposed to limiting these models 
and the total amount of compute that they have of 1% being at the time of inference. We're saying, why not give it 25%? Like exponentially increase the amount of time that we give it to think. And I've got a visual up here just to give you a sense of how much time and like the ratio is how much they're changing here. But with that extra processing power, it actually changes a lot of the ecosystem in terms of, hey, how much money should we be spending on um, training hardware versus inference hardware? How do these models scale? What is the best methodology to get the back best mile? Like how big do the parameters need to be? Um, all of these things are in impacted by this new way of basically extracting knowledge and information from these models. Um, so super, super interesting development. And you're basically saying, therefore, it means uh, rather than spending all the money on the training, just get a faster chip and maybe that's actually better in the long run. Yeah, and so it basically does mean that you don't have to have as much training hardware. The emphasis may actually be on inference hardware going forward. So Sasha, the other thing that no one is really talking about is how we even got here, the who. Like, uh, there's a guy named Noam Brown, you are a fanboy, admit it. And his research in like poker, risk, like these games actually led us down this path of reasoning that we get in 01 preview. So share a little bit about Mr. Noam. Yeah, so Noam actually helped calibrate the AI opponent that people play against in these games like poker, risk, diplomacy. And it turns out that a lot of the logic and the reasoning that helps build these organic looking uh, opponents ends up transferring over into the real world and they end up being fantastic simulation environments for, for the real world. Because what how these um, agents are working in, in video games is basically they're charting out a decision tree of potential actions and then doing that again for each of the nodes and, and then choosing the, the branch that makes the most sense. And we can put up a, a, a screenshot here just to give people a visualization of what this looks like. But essentially, that's what's happening in these models. And, and that's why they say it's kind of like having a PhD in your pocket because it, it knows what the most relevant course of action is in order to solve a problem for each specific domain. So it'll have a very high level of chemistry, physics, mathematics understanding. And then it can go through, chart out what the decision tree for each of those nodes should look like and then go through and execute it and give you a relatively informed answer. So that's why people are saying it's, um, you know, the the work that Noam Brown and his team have done is effectively put a PhD in your pocket. And, you know, I, I play with O1 Preview and I'm started asking it questions like, you know, what's the weather and things like that. I didn't get a really impressive answer. I don't know what, what are the things you asked it? I mean, I think one of the craziest things asked was, uh, if I dropped a gallon of milk from outer space, how long would it take for the plastic to disintegrate and the milk to basically go everywhere. And it gave a pretty, you know, educated answer. We went through and said, okay, well, here's how gravity affected. Here's how air resistance. Here's the friction of air turning into heat. Here's the specific heat capacity of the milk. And it said like, you know, by about something like, you know, one kilometer per second or a thousand, you know, whatever, like meters per second, it'll it'll basically start to disintegrate. <laughs> and when I asked GPT-4 the same question, it said somewhere between 800 and 1200. It's way, way, way more accurate because it can go down and identify the specific variables and then actually do the calculations for each of the stages. I'm more curious about why you even asked that question to begin with what's in your head, bro. <laughs> I've got a weird, weird sense of curiosity. <laughs> okay, now let's just do a little rewind because uh, related to one preview, um, uh, Devin, our, our software engineer, uh, actually had early access to O1 preview and they did some benchmarks. Here's a screenshot. Uh, last week we were talking about cursor, sort of AI generated software development. Devin had early access to O1 and you can see this is a material improvement in its ability to write software. And so I will still claim that it's still kind of dumb compared to a real software engineer, which you will disagree with me on, but I guess the proof is in the pudding and it's here based on some benchmarks. Yeah, and you look at like the Devon base with GPT-4.0 and then without the you know, Devon production fine tuning and all the, the, you know, the stuff that they bought on, I mean, it's, it's basically doubling the existing uh, capability um, just out of the box. That's really, really impressive. I mean, you're basically getting 60, 70% of the final production version of Devon with an API call. That's crazy. For $20 a month, that's crazy. Like you gotta admit, like the, the front like, end here is moving very, very quickly. And you gotta keep in mind, we are in version one of this and we're not even working with the most capable model. This is their preview 
of their most capable model. The, it's, it's rumored that the next model is actually coming out um, in the next couple of weeks or months and that the pricing may change as well. This is all rumors, but um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm blown away by this stuff. And, and there's actually a fantastic uh, demo, like demos floating around on, on Twitter and X about some of the cool stuff that people built, like this one where Chubby posted, uh, <laughs> O1 Preview made a 3D FPS game fully in HTML. I don't know. That's pretty cool. And it like did this all in minutes. Like, yeah. At just 20 bucks a month compared to my salary. It's not a bad deal, right? <laughs> You're trying to put me out of a job. They're putting me out of a job. Anyways, so Sasha, you must be happy now. Strawberry's out and you are a set man. What's going to come yeah. out next week? Yeah, I'm excited. I, I mean, I don't know what to come out next week, but this is a fantastic first step. All right. Take care, man. Yeah.